Today, well today as ever, we're going to listen to our subscribers and a lot of them keep saying, well you haven't really done regular expressions head on, you keep on mentioning them as though we know all about them but we don't. It would be nice to have a sort of regular expressions explained as it were. So although I'm going to do my best to do regular expressions completely as a one-off, no previous experience needed, for those of you who who look at it and think, oh, come on, this relates to something else. We will give you the link to go to the previous episodes and you can get more details about just how it links into other things. To those of you who think I must be infinitely old and personal friends of all these people, well, I am of some of them, but not all. And today's hero is called Stephen Claney. He is the man who, in the mid-1950s, invented regular expressions. What Claney wanted was a way that he didn't have to draw diagrams like this one, but that he could abbreviate what the automaton was doing. So I'm going to number these states 0, 1 and 2, and I'm going to label this one over here as being the finish state. And this is going to be an incredibly simple string fragment, a fragment of a string of characters that we're going to recognise. This is the automaton way of depicting it. At the start you are in state zero and we're going to say that in state zero, as you are analysing your input string, we'll put some input strings down here that this thing will be able to recognise. If what you see at the start of your string at the moment, not being coped with, is a letter A, then you're going to state one. If, let's take the simplest one I want to recognise, if in state one you've coped with the A, if the next character is C, then that is acceptable. So I write a C over that transition arc here, and that gets me into state two. Usually the finished state is sometimes distinguished by drawing a sort of double circle like that. So you just glance at it and say, ah, that's it. So yeah. What I've drawn there certainly recognises the string AC. Frankly, electronics engineers and so on were using these not in the late 50s, in the early 50s. They used them for creating and understanding what they called state machines. And as I say, Claney sort of liked the idea, liked the pictorial notation, but wanted to see if he could get it to be more compact. So let's just finish the story by saying that if you come around on this loop and re-enter state one, you can do so by recognizing a B in the string. So we've already shown that it can recognize A, C. You just come here, you start, you get an A, you see a C and you're finished. But equally, as we now see, it would also accept A, B, C. Start here, C and A, if the next character in your string is a B, fine, you accept it, but you come back into state one. Although it doesn't explicitly involve a stack, this is like a sort of iterative recursive re-entry into the same state. But the only way out of that state to the finish is via accepting a C at the end of the string for number two. You can keep going around this B loop as long as you want. It will certainly accept A, B, B, C, A, 3, B, C, and so on. And effectively what Kleiner came up with as being a good way of talking about these things over the phone and not having to draw diagrams is to say in his regular expression notation that it accepts A, B star, C. And this is the first bit of Kleiner invented notation, that star, which as we almost all of us now know means zero or more of. Well, there we are then. The strings that that automaton accepts is A followed by zero or more Bs finishing with a C. And the nice thing about this regular expression notation is just look at how compact it is. It is just so much easier to handle in a program than trying to do elementary computer graphics and literally draw yourself automata. Although for pictorially, I think everybody 
like this way of sketching out what your automaton would accept. Those of you, some of you may have seen it. If not, follow the link out to the things we did about three years ago. You'll find in there an automaton that accepts 25 pence in order to issue a parking permit. It's all done with quite complicated but locally simple little transitions on either coins or characters or whatever. So just to underline and re-emphasize why this regular expression notation of Kleiner's was seized upon because it was so compact is let's complete the triangle. One side of the triangle is the automaton approach. Another side of the triangle we've now seen is the regular expression approach, completely equivalent. But if we look at the Chomsky grammar approach done on the playlist, would that be compact and nice? Not so much. The rules on Chomsky grammars in their purest form is that if you use a capital letter, that is a so-called non-terminal symbol. There'll be another left-hand side rule that develops it further, whereas lowercase literally means what it says. So this means, well, Chomsky tended to call them all sentences. A sentence in this limited language is a little letter A followed by anything that a B can be. So I have to complete this by saying, well, what can a capital B become? Well, Again, look at the automaton diagram to which it's completely equivalent. What happens with a B is you can spit out a lowercase letter B or a B, or you can have a much simpler rule that says a capital B can just become the letter C. So there we are. <laughs> Instead of one small line, we've got three lines. And if you're doing it the grammar way, and you might say, oh, well, can't you abbreviate that grammar a bit more? It's, it's awful having to do three lines like that. It's very verbose. Uh, yeah, here's the, uh, here is the allowed shortening, but it's not much. Is You could say, all right, I will allow myself the luxury of the or bar and put a C there. So it's down to two lines now, not three. What it's saying is a B can be a lowercase b followed by recursive re-entry into B again, or it can just be the letter C. So we're down to two lines, but it's still nowhere near as compact and nice as the regular expression is. And what I must absolutely emphasize, can't emphasize too much, I should put double-headed arrows all over the place here, is that all of these things, the automaton diagram, the regular expression, the grammar, they are all completely equivalent to each other. Those of you who've been through mathematics courses will know your instructors go on and on and on about, no, I'm not asking it whether one is a subset of the other or one is contained within the other, but there's a little bit extra. No, they are completely and totally equivalent. There is not a single thing that one will accept that the other won't and vice versa. So it's just a matter of convenience of the notation, perhaps if you're a computer scientist, for using in a programming context. And I think the other thing that also had to be coped with is to say, well, all right, you can do it as an automaton diagram, you can do it as a regular expression, you can do it as a grammar. Regular expression is looking good because of the compactness of the notation, but um, are we sure that there aren't some snags in this process of saying they're equivalent? Well, one snag that did occur and was recognized very early on in the late 1950s, I mean, all of this, is that sometimes looking at it, let's look at it from the automaton diagram point of view. Sometimes you get a situation where what you want is what's called non-deterministic. In other words, I'm happy here because there's only one exit from zero to get you into one, it's labeled A. How would it be if I took another arrow out of zero and said A could also lead you somewhere else? So let's just draw up a little um, diagram of what horrors that might be. What happens and what would you do about it? If you say, well, my regular expression, let's call it E, is actually, either A, B, A, B, or I want to recognize A, B, B, B. Now, you might say, well, that's useless. How, you know, how does that fit into anything? It does illustrate, though, a very, very important point. 
which is that if you are trying to build an automaton or recognizer for this, you've got two alternatives. Here you are at state zero, and you want to go into possibly two completely different directions, but they both begin A. How do you choose? For the moment, I'm saying no cheating. No, you're not allowed to look ahead. You just get given an A. What do you do? And worse still, of course, it doesn't end there. It then goes on that whichever route you go, you find that the next thing is you've got to recognize a B. So the common factor, if you like, and it is like factorizing expressions in algebra, you know, x cubed minus one, take out an x squared, factorize it out at the front, it's x squared x minus one. That's sort of, it's similar in principle to that. Now, of course, they do change a bit eventually because this one accepts an A here and then finishes up by accepting a B. This one Next one goes a B and another B and finally it gets down into the finished state as well. OK, well, it looks trivial, but what are you going to do? Here you are, the programmer trying to implement this. You look at the string and you say, but there's two ways I can cope with this. The most amazing thing about this is that two theoreticians in the late 50s won the Turing ACM award for saying it will always be possible to turn the non-deterministic one into a deterministic one. Now how would we do that on this case? Easy. You start off with zero. You say that first of all we'll accept you always do an A and then a B. That's the common factor, if you like, for the start. But you put your split point here, that that continues with an A and that line continues with a B to get the two avenues that you see up there. So we're factorizing out the A and the B. And the story was, well, it's all right for us humans who are really intelligent to see that you can do that. But will it always be possible for these things to turn the non-deterministic one into a deterministic one where you force it through factorization first. And the answer from Dana Scott and Michael Rabin in the late 1950s was it is always doable. So long as you stick to simple finite state automata, don't start monkeying around with extra RAM or stacks, just stick to them as they are. You can always do it, but it can get very, very hairy. So who was the first person who plunged headlong into this and said, I'm going to do it. Answer, Ken Thompson, our hero from Unix, Bell Labs and the whole lot. By the late 60s, he effectively was saying, this regular expression stuff is great for pattern matching in editors. I want to use it. But this problem of non-determinism, how do I cope with it? And it is the most amazingly far-sighted piece of work. You, you understand, when you look at this, why Ken Thompson is a legend. He basically said, I'm going, I know it's non-deterministic, but I look at all possibilities and I'll start pre-compiling little bits of assembler code to cope with whichever one turns up on the day, as it were. And everybody was open-mouthed about this. He also realized, he said, look, yeah, if you don't mind doing pre-processing, you can actually, you know, Michael and Dana have shown us that it is possible. Yeah, I know how to do that. But on the other hand, that could take some time because it's all very well doing a little toy example like this, but non-determinism in a big real life automaton could be held to disentangle. What's an example of one of those then? What like... Um... Well, let me give you one example which sounds utterly innocuous, but which I can give you, Sean, a complete page that you can show to the fans about this. Brian Kernighan wanted to get a regular expression recognizer for all of the keywords and all of the constructs in his pick language, which after all is a preprocessor for the Unix TROF typesetting language. He just wanted to draw simple line diagrams. So we've got primitives like circle, line, ellipse, from, to, with, dotted to show you the nature of the line, all this kind of stuff. It looks innocuous, biggish, but innocuous. And uh, he put it through one of these NFA to DFA, let's stop it being non-deterministic. We want fast recognition. We want to build an engine. Don't care if it has more states than the non-deterministic one, but boy, it's got to go off like a Lamborghini, right? So 
be prepared to spend some pre-processing time. You can put out his release note with PIC, which says the Lex phase takes an eon, 15 minutes on a VAX 750. Full stop. Be patient. Brian is always noted for his Ernest Hemingway terseness, you know. So <laughs> that is what can come to haunt you, is that deconvoluting, tracing around everything to get it deterministic. It is worthwhile if you are going to be putting huge pick scripts through this. So you're hammering it over and over and over again. You think, I've got to get this really efficient, otherwise we'll be here forever while we're using it. On the other hand, Ken's usage of it in the Unix editor ED took the pragmatic view. This thing, ED, in the early days, because stream editor Lee McMahon hadn't been invented yet, just ED. You can get away with very simple regular expressions because that's all that humans will use. If you're feeding it stuff that's been prepared by another program, that's when your pet schemes tend to die the death because stuff prepared by another program can exploit little wrinkles that cause you great difficulty. But Ken said, no, in ED, I think I can get away with keeping it non-deterministic, but preparing and look ahead. It's one of the first examples of just-in-time compilation. He took the attitude, I'll look at which way the cookie crumbles, try and work out which is the most likely, and pre-compute pieces of fast assembler code that I can put in to actually execute these things. And it was the most amazing flexible system. It basically adapted to the input. It is a good example of just-in-time compilation. What Ken says is, I'll do it as I need it. Brian in Pick couldn't say that because it's basically much more like a compiler. And it's a compiler that's been driven by reams of externally provided input. So two approaches to the same thing. Are you going to make it deterministic in all cases ahead of time, or are you going to cope with it as you go? The man goes to town, as we would say. To town, the man goes. Sounded to me 20 years ago when I first stumbled on this very much like Yoda the Jedi Master. For those of you coming into this cold and direct because you saw the word Yoda and uh, grept over the entire universe,